Hello Year 5 and welcome to your next reading lesson for this week. So today we're going to look at summarising key information. Okay, now our success criteria is pretty much the same as it was before. Looking at keywords and the questions, which we do in every single lesson. Thinking carefully about the order of the events that have happened. This is why it's important to make sure you concentrate when you're reading the text today. It's important for you to then know what's important information and what information is not important if we were to summarise something that's happened. And we're going to have a go at answering the number it questions. So there's different types of questions, just like there are for the different skills. So today we're going to primarily focus on that skilled lesson. Okay. So let's have a quick retrieval practice. So have a go at answering these questions in your in your books or on your piece of paper at home, and then we'll go through the answers. Okay, so who did Sorrel and Friedrich meet in the abandoned building? Well, they met a boy, didn't they? The boy came scurrying out from behind the desk, and his name was Ben. Okay, so he bumped into this little boy called Ben. How did Sorrel describe the smell of the city? Well, this was actually quite a common feature all the way throughout the book, because Friedrich believed this as well. But they mostly described the city as smelling of humans. Obviously, they're in the human world. They're in a big city. Obviously, there's lots of humans around, so she described the smells as being human-like. And what two words have we learnt in this chapter? Okay. Okay, you would be correct. We looked at dismal. So when something is very gloomy, it's very dull, it's very boring. We also looked at an adverb yesterday of tentatively. So when we do something cautiously or very gently or maybe slightly anxiously because we're not 100% certain about something. So it's when you don't have the confidence and you do something very cautiously. Okay. So we're going to look at some more vocabulary today. Okay. And then we're going to have a go at reading some of our chapter pages, which you need to have out in front of you. And then we'll have a go at looking at the task for today. So on page 26, we're going to be looking at this sentence, clutching the balustrade of the bridge. So the word we're looking at today is balustrade. Okay. Now this is three syllables, balustrade. Okay. It's almost got one letter in the middle, balustrade. Okay. Now this is a very, very fancy word. But I'm sure if I explain a definition, you'll know exactly what it is I'm talking about. So you might have at home uh, a banister that runs along the top of your upstairs part of your house. And it might be running along the side of the staircase as well. So those little rungs that are in between, okay, that's the balustrade. That's the railing that's the support between the edge of your edge of your staircase or on the, the hallway landing upstairs. You tend to find them on balconies and bridges. So if you're ever driving on the motorway and you see a bridge that goes over the top and you can see all the individual railings, that's a balustrade. Okay, so that's all of the railings in between. And sometimes you find them in very old Greek or Roman buildings. If you go to like the Roman baths, you'll see the big columns in between. So, so a balustrade is a railing that's there to support another feature. Okay, most common thing you'll find in your house is up the side of a staircase. So let's put it into a sentence. Jenny grabs the balustrade to stop her falling down the stairs. Okay, so she's clung onto those railings. Okay, that part of the banister that's going to stop her falling down the stairs. Now, there aren't too many synonyms or antonyms for this word because it's a noun. Okay, so it's obviously it's the name of something. So it's not like we're swapping it in for the opposite of an adjective or an adverb. But you could consider it as being almost like a wall. Okay, so like you've got the, your wall of columns that's there to protect you. It could be the columns or some form of barrier that's almost like a protection layer. Okay, now there are no antonyms, okay, because it's a noun. Obviously, the opposite of not having a balcony that's got the barriers protected would just be a line that goes all the way across that you can fall off on either side. Or having a staircase that you just walk all the way up that doesn't have the banister and the railings underneath it. So there's no antonyms as such for that because it's a noun. But that's one of the words we'll come across today of the balustrade. Another word we're going to look at. So, page 29, quickly clambered down it. Now, you've probably come across this word quite a few times. It's quite it's quite a common word, but I thought let's look into it a little bit further today. So, we're looking at the word clambered. Now, this is a verb. Now, in this example, in the sentence, it's a past tense verb. So, this is something that's already happened. Now, this on here isn't three syllables. I apologise, it's only two syllables. So, it's clambered. Okay, fairly easy, clambered. Now, the to define this word, it means to climb or move in an awkward way using your hands and feet. So you imagine when you're a little bit younger, or even now sometimes, you're racing up the stairs, 
You might suddenly go clambering up the staircase, but you use your hands and knees to crawl all the way up to the top. And obviously you don't do it in a particularly elegant or cool fashion. You sort of, yeah, yeah, hands and your arms and your feet are all over the place. So that means to clamber. So let's give you another example then so that for any of you Harry Potter fans out there. The Weasley brothers all clambered into the small pokey flying car. Now, you know, there's a lot of Weasley brothers in the Harry Potter movies, okay? So there's a lot of them trying to get into a very small car, so they're going to clamber. So very awkwardly, they're going to try and climb into this car all at once. So other words that we can use for this is to scramble. So scrambled is almost a little bit of a chaotic way of moving around. You could climb. If you said that someone scaled a mountain, that's the same as saying they climbed the mountain. But you don't necessarily do it in the clumsiest of fashions, but obviously there's not always a direct route. So you kind of have to zigzag when you scale some things. That would be the same thing when you clambered. You're not going to do it in a, very, in a you know, a clear straight line. And you could mean to ascend some things when you climb up. Now, there aren't really any antonyms to that word because the opposite of walking up and down the staircase or clambering up and down the staircase would just be to do it normally and not on your hands and feet like you're a gorilla or another animal, okay? So those are some of the synonyms that we can match with that word. So those are the two words that we're going to come across in our reading today. Now, same rules as applies to all of the other videos. If you'd like to read on, read on yourself and you'd like to skip this part of the video, by all means. If not, you can sit and read along and listen to my beautiful voice. So, chapter five, Gilbert the ship's rat. Which warehouse is it? asked Ben. If you don't know the number, we could have a long search ahead of us. They were standing on a narrow bridge. Warehouses lined both sides of the canal. Strange, narrow buildings of red stone with tall windows and pointed gables. The harbour of the big city wasn't far away, and a cold wind was blowing from that direction, almost tearing the hood away from Sorrel's pointy ears. A great many humans were pushing past them, but no one stopped and stared at the small figure with Ben clutching the balustrade of the bridge. The sleeves of Ben's sweatshirt, which were much too long for her, hid Sorrel's paws. His jeans, turned up twice at the bottom, hid her legs and her cat-like face was hidden in the shadow of the hood. Rat said it's the last warehouse before the river, she whispered, and her cousin lives in the cellar. Rat, you don't mean a real rat? Do you? Ben looked at Sorrel doubtfully. Of course she's real. What do you think? Don't just stand there looking stupid. Not that you don't do it well, but we've got more important things to do. She impatiently pulled Ben along with her. The bridge led to a narrow road running beside the bank. As they hurried along the pavement, Sorrel kept looking anxiously around. The sound of motor traffic hurt her ears. She had been in small towns before stealing fruit from gardeners, exploring cellars and teasing dogs. But there were no gardens here, no bushes where you could crouch down and hide in a hurry. Everything in this city was made of stone. Sorrel was greatly relieved when Ben guided her into a narrow alleyway which led back to the canal between the last two warehouses. There were several doors in the red walls. Two were closed, but when Ben pushed the third, it opened with a slight creak. They hurried in. An unlit stairway lay before them. Daylight filtered in through a narrow, dusty window and revealed one flight of steps leading up and another down. Ben looked suspiciously down the dark steps. They'll be wrapped there, that's for sure, he whispered. The question is, can we find the right one? How will we recognise it? Does it wear a collar or a tie or something? Sorrel didn't answer. She pushed back her hood and scurried down the steps. Ben followed her. It was so dark at the foot of the steps that he took the torch out of his jacket pocket. A cellar with a high vaulted ceiling lay before them and once again he saw any number of doors. Huh? Sorrel inspected the torch and shook her head scornfully. I've looked at the word scornfully. You humans need your little machines for everything, don't you? Even to look at things. It's not a machine. Ben swept the beam of the torch over the doors. What are we actually looking for, a mouse hole? Don't be silly. Sorrel pricked up her ears and twitched her nose. Still snuffling, she moved slowly from door to door. Ah, here we are. She stopped in front of a brown door that was slightly ajar. Sorrel pushed it open just far enough for her to slip through the crack. Ben followed. My goodness, he murmured. The tall, windowless room they entered was stuffed with junk up to the ceiling. Among shelves full of dusty folders stood stacks of old chairs. Tables piled on top of each other, cupboards without doors, mountains of index card files and empty drawers. 
Sorrel raised her nose, sniffing, then shot purposefully away. Ben banged his shin following her. He had already lost track of the door they'd come through. The further they went in, the more chaotic the clutter became. Suddenly, more shelving units barred their way. Well, that's it then, I suppose, said Ben, leaning, letting the beam of his torch wander around the place. But Sorrel ducked, crawled through a gap between two shelves, and disappeared. Hey, wait for me, Ben cried, and pushed his head through the gap. He was peering at a small study. A study just the right size for a rat, barely a metre away from him and underneath a chair. The desk was a book propped on two sardine cans. A coffee mug turned upside down did duty as a chair. There were card index files full of tiny slips of paper. Empty matchboxes stood everywhere, and the whole place was lit by an ordinary desk lamp standing on the floor beside the chair. But whoever it was who used the study was nowhere to be seen. You stay here, Sorrel whispered to Ben. I don't think Rat's cousin will be particularly pleased to see a human being. Oh, come off it. Ben crawled through the gap and straightened up. If it doesn't get a fright at the sight of you, it won't mind me either. Anyway, it's, in a li it's living in a human building. I don't suppose I'll be the first human it ever saw. He, hissed Sorrel, it's a he, and don't you forget it. She looked around her curiously. As well as the little study area under the chair, there was also a human-sized desk, a huge chest of drawers, and a large old globe of the world hanging at an angle on its stand. Hello, called Sorrel. Anyone home? Oh, drat it. What's his name again? Giz Gizzlebert? No, Godfrey. No. Gilbert Greytail or some such. Something rustled above the desk. Ben and Sorrel looked up and saw a fat white rat looking down at them from his perch on top of a dusty lampshade. What do you want? asked the rat in shrill tones. Your cousin sent me, Gilbert, said Sorrel. Which one? said the rat warily. I've got hundreds of cousins. Which one? Sorrel scratched her head. Well, we always just call her rat. Wait a moment. I remember. Her name's Rosa. That's it. You've come from Rosa? Gilbert Greytail let a tiny rope ladder down from the lampshade and quickly clambered down it. He landed on the big desk with a thump. Oh, well, that's different. He stroked his whiskers, which were white as snow, like his coat. What can I do for you? There's this place I'm looking for, Sorrel said, told him. Well, it's a mountain range, really. Ah, the white rat nodded looking rather pleased with himself. You've come to exactly the right person.